Okay, it's 1.30, let's begin. A very warm welcome to everyone out there. We are delighted that you are joining us for this kickoff of our lecture series, Cultures of the Crisis, which is presented by the chair group European Culture and Literature at the University of Groningen in the Netherlands. My name is Florian Lippert. I'm deputy chair of uh, the group, and I have the pleasure to host and moderate this lecture series together with my dear colleague, Dr. Konstantin Mirau, who is supporting us with managing participants today. Thanks again, Konstantin. A bit of technical information. Uh, we will now see the lectures, and afterwards I will switch on the chat function so that everyone can ask a question, and depending on the amount of questions, I will make a selection and forward the respective questions to the speakers. If you should experience any kind of difficulties throughout the lecture, if your browser kicks you out or anything like that, uh, please try to log in again. And if that should be unsuccessful, so if, should, if you cannot participate uh, throughout the whole lecture, then you're very welcome to watch the recording, which will be made available via our series website, with which you should be familiar. It's a website through which you logged in. In most cases, if you're not familiar with the website yet, simply Google Cultures of the Crisis Groningen. So since this is the very first lecture of the series, I will very briefly introduce the idea behind it now, basically just two minutes uh, explaining what we mean by this title, Cultures of the Crisis. Well, the crisis itself doesn't need any further introduction or explanation, I guess, uh, whereas cultures of possibly does. So uh, first, what we understand by the term the cultures of the crisis uh, is as critical cultural studies would understand a culture, namely broadly speaking, as a set of practices, what people do. And uh, it's clear that what has started as a public health crisis has very soon turned into a crisis of many different dimensions. So just yesterday, for instance, uh, the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres stated that, I quote him, uh, this health crisis has quickly turned into a crisis of human rights under some authoritarian government. Or think of the rise in domestic violence. Uh, think of the new outbreaks of nationalism through scapegoating, for instance, such as by the American president. Or uh, racist stereotyping, such as by some representatives of North European governments. So uh, the crisis has not only affected many everyday cultural practices, right? How we how we interact or not, how we communicate, like we're doing right now, how people socialize, how people work, etc. Uh, but it has also very strongly affected what people are allowed to do all over the world, uh, the dangers in which they are beyond the actual virus and uh, also the ways in which they are being indoctrinated, what they think of other people, what they think of other countries. So all these more cultural shifts are very important effects that demand critical analysis. And this is the basis for this lecture series. Uh, the second meaning of cultures of the crisis would be a bit more of an uh, ethnological meaning, so to speak. So given all these divides I just referred to, and uh, uh, also, given our current confinement on the other hand, right, we're, we're, we're bound to certain spaces. We think it's all the more important to look beyond our own borders, to look beyond our own national media and our own much discussed social uh, social media bubbles. Uh, so we are also aiming to look at cultural settings, so to speak, beyond our own in this lecture series. And today in this uh, kickoff lecture, it's my great pleasure to welcome uh, three colleagues from the chair group European Culture and Literature who will showcase uh, how we do that. And the first colleague is the chair of the chair group, uh, Professor Paul Divia, who besides being full professor and chair of European Culture and Literature at the University of Groningen, has also recently been appointed associate professor at Harvard University, namely at the John A. Paulson School of Engineering and Applied Sciences. Pablo is also the academic director of the Netherlands Research School for Literary Studies, in short, OSL, and expert scientific advisor of the Netherlands Institute of Advanced Studies in Social Sciences and Humanities, and the Netherlands Royal Academy of Arts and Sciences. 
So uh, welcome, dear Pablo, once more, and I hand over to you. Well, thank you very much for your very kind uh, a, a presentation and uh, invite to participate here. Uh, I fully subscribe your words. I would simply like to, to mention that uh, this is a great initiative that is coordinated by, by Florian, who is, is the, uh, the, the soul of this uh, project. Uh, and uh, also I would like to thank all colleagues involved in the series, the great job uh, do done by Florian and other colleagues. And also I would like to, to thank uh, uh, CS Harvard uh, Paulson School of Inge uh, Engineering and Applied Sciences uh, for also sponsoring this, this event. So thank you very much, all of you, for your presence uh, today. Great, thanks a lot to you, Pablo. Uh, so to, to finish the, the introductory uh, job, uh, Pablo is joined today by two great uh, colleagues from the chair group, namely Judith Jansma, who is a university lecturer in our chair group and a PhD candidate at Groningen's Faculty of Arts. Uh, she's an expert in French culture and literature and populism and the chair of the program committee European languages and cultures as well as a member of the advisory board of aforementioned OSL and last but not least the first speaker today will be James Lee who is also a lecturer and a PhD candidate at the faculty of arts James research focus lies in history of politics uh, more specifically central and eastern Europe especially western Balkans and the former Yugoslavia so I'm handing over to you now, uh, dear James, and we will also start showing the slides. Please take it away, James. Um, so thank you to Pablo and to Florian for uh, the introduction. And I would like to say that I see my role here before I hand over the word to you and Pablo is to set the stage for the rest of this lecture. And in particular, I want to use my time to build a picture of what we mean with this word on solidarity and to mainly focus on some actions which uh, illustrate commercialization and profiteering surrounding the crisis, both in a financial and a political sense. But as a starting point for thinking about the topic, I wanted to bring up a well-known expression, which in English generally takes the form of never letting a good crisis go to waste. And it's a phrase which has often come to mind in recent weeks as we follow current events from around the world and we've witnessed the actions of different political political and also commercial actors. And sad to say, but whenever the notion did raise his head, it was rarely for positive reasons. So I wondered then, does that necessarily have to be the case? Or are there in fact other ways of making the most of a so-called good crisis? So while I was looking up this uh, phrase, it was interesting to note that there's quite some confusion that arises, at least in the online world, as is often the case with how the expression is attributed. And in the form it's used here, it's often portrayed and possibly falsely at that as being a famous Churchillian quote. But the phrase is often is, is, is often also being traced back further still, for example, to Niccolo Machiavelli. And his version supposedly encourages us to never waste the opportunity offered by a good crisis. And those are just a couple of the variations that you might come across. So why do I draw attention to this? Because I thought that, well, within these frequent attributions, we can define two quite different possibilities of how the expression is interpreted and understood. And in turn, how this might then be related to certain ideas about solidarity and about unsolidarity. Um, so to begin with, what would be a potential uh, Machiavellian understanding? So a caveat here, I apologize if I'm misusing Machiavelli to make a point, but I'm mainly referring to a popular notion of Machiavellianism and not so much to the man himself. So in common understandings, when we say that an action is Machiavellian, we could imply that it is immoral or at least amoral or cunning and sly, and these are the kind of associations we have. So when we talk about a good crisis, a Machiavellian interpretation of not letting it go to waste would imply that we seek maximum benefit, especially personal benefit, that can be extracted from this bad situation, taking advantage of the circumstances to improve our own position, regardless of broader consequences or implications for others. And that 
is, I think, something that encapsulates our idea about unsolidarity. So political actions, which often seem to go against our shared understandings of societal and global solidarity, which in contrast are characterized by agreement, support, and action on the basis of common interest and through coordinated efforts. But what then of the so-called Churchillian interpretation? So allegedly when Churchill was referring to the good crisis, it, it suggested he was talking about reconstruction and the creation of post-war organizations such as the UN. So in this case, it was the crisis of the Second World War that contributed to the development of a new order and political structure. So where there is crisis, there is also opportunity, and that works for both kinds of understandings. But the question is what kind of opportunity and what do we do with it? So in the latter understanding, this is an opportunity to take positive steps and to create positive change and realize new forms of global solidarity. So a crisis can provide a chance to challenge some norms and practices which have previously been taken for granted. And I hope that that is the conclusion that we'll be able to reach with this lecture today. But first, before we get into that, it might be helpful to, or rather it's my job to illustrate the concept of unsolidarity a bit further. And that's perhaps best done through some recent concrete examples, um, whereby I want to show what we refer to when we speak of acts of unsolidarity and how it appears in practice. These are just a few recent examples. There are, of course, more than I'm able to go into, but I've just picked a few. Um, to begin with, some of these actions are less nefarious than others, but in general, we can say there is a certain moral or ethical questionability at work. At the lowest level, and particularly now talking about commercialization, um, I've noticed uh, recently advertisements for various companies such as KPN, uh, Energy Direct and so on within the Netherlands at least, um, which are not especially calculated, but they do take advantage of audience emotions for the purposes of company branding. So these adverts represent aspects of the current situation regarding, say, social distancing and people staying at home, but do so as a means of promoting the service that they are currently providing. And although ultimately those adverts are transmitting a positive message, it's difficult to escape from the fact that there is a commercialization of solidarity or acts of solidarity that's taking place here. Brands see this as an opportunity to position themselves towards consumers. Secondly, we have the case of Rumag, which is a Dutch media company in apparel brand. Um, and some weeks ago, Rumag was selling amusing face masks for profit on its online store. And although those have since been removed, um, in a, a show a few weeks ago, the TV comedian Ian drew attention then to a line of t-shirts which featured a message of solidarity, I believe in you and me, and which were ostensibly sold to raise money for the Red Cross, but were in fact given marked up products and marked up delivery costs as a way of also generating profit for the Rumag brand itself. So again, this is an idea of a kind of commercialized version of solidarity, but that takes a step beyond mere branding to profiteering. Thirdly, we have uh, an example of fraud cases surrounding the sale and trade in personal protective equipment or PPE. Um, so some recent Volkskrant reports described how misleading and counterfeit certification was being used to sell face masks and safety glasses, which didn't meet European standards, but nevertheless appeared on the market. Due to massive shortages of PPE across Europe, um, it appears that there were certain commercial actors who saw an opportunity to boost earnings by switching production to those materials, even not having the necessary certification. And in some cases, this was also aided by bad actors within European certification firms. So we see that it did not take long for people to find ways of generating profit out of crisis, even if here this means resorting to fraud. And the final case I wanted to mention in the more financial focus is insider trading. So uh, you probably heard that in March, many uh, media outlets reported on a case involving senators who were suspected of acting on inside information and selling participation of a crime. And a striking example here involved the senator Kelly Loeffler, who reportedly sold millions 
in stock in the lead up to the market crash while simultaneously buying shares in teleworking company Citrix and the cloud platform service provider Oracle, which suggests that even in this moment of crisis, there were elected officials who were not only interested in defending their own investment, but even looked at means to generate personal financial profit based on the information they were receiving. So again, there is a questionable moral and ethical nature to these kinds of actions, if the allegations indeed are correct, that would move into the territory of criminality. But beyond politicians seeking to gain personal financial profit, we can also find cases of political actors using the situation not to work together in solidarity with others, but instead to further their goals when it comes to questions of political power. And I wanted to focus here on the case of the overthrow of the uh, recently established Kosovo government. So uh, Kosovo held elections in October of last year, which resulted in a victory for two opposition parties, one being Vet Vendosia, um, which has been a growing strength in domestic politics in Kosovo, having developed out of a grassroots movement um, around 10 years ago. And uh, let you know that then after a couple of months in power, uh, this coalition collapsed. And ostensibly, this was over differences in opinion precisely about how the corona crisis should be addressed within the country. Um, so the official trigger for this was that the LDK health minister gave statements on television about the safety measures which were contradictory to what had been agreed by the government. And so he was ejected from government, which the coalition broke up, and the uh, government fell uh, via a no-confidence vote, which was actually brought by one of the two coalition members in LDK itself. But what was interesting about this whole situation was whether there was a bit more to it than initially... Uh, seemed to be the case. So whilst there was a suggestion that the coalition was already in disagreement about, for example, trade with uh, with Serbia, the neighbouring country, and how to approach the ongoing EU brokered dialogue, uh, there was also a visible split that existed within the party LDK itself, which was between a kind of so-called old guard, who has been in, in place since the early 1990s, and then younger party members who were the face of the electoral success last year. Um, rumours have circulated as well that uh, the current president, Hashim Thatchi, who is a former guerrilla leader, um, is preparing to sign a new peace deal with Belgrade that most likely would have been blocked by the Vet Vendosia led government. And as such, this coalition seemed to be standing in way of those foreign policy objectives, objectives which interestingly enough, also happened to be shared with the US government, whose ambassador subsequently backed this no confidence vote. But reporting also hints at another even more personal impending threat for Thatchy and his former comrades. So uh, judges at the Kosovo Specialist Chambers, which is a special court based in The Hague, trying ex-KLA uh, guerrillas, including many people who are members of the president's own party, uh, are currently reviewing a number of indictments. And some indeed believe that the ousting of the government is an attempt to prevent those impending indictments by taking over executive power. There is further evidence of backroom dealings between the LDK's old guard, such as the former Prime Minister Issa Mustafa, and the other party leaders from this previous coalition, which is generally known as the War Coalition. So what happens now is that people in Pristina are holding nightly balcony protests and demanding that the politicians behave more responsibly during the corona crisis. And questions remain as to whether or not there are ulterior motives involved in the fall of the government and if the current crisis presented an opportunity to bring down the new coalition. It's the first real threat to an order that has held on to power since 1999. But at the very least, we can say that this global health crisis doesn't seem to be the moment to instigate those kinds of political maneuverings when stability and visible leadership are needed, as this is only likely to prompt more unrest amongst the population. So this feels like the embodiment of political unsolidarity and individual profiteering as such, making the most of a good crisis in the true Machiavellian sense. And at that point, I would like to hand over to Judith.
Yes, so let's hope this works. Florian, can you confirm? Yes, it works very well. And we also see you via camera. Oh, that's fantastic. All right. So then let's hope it stays like this. And I will continue uh, with these great uh, examples that were just presented to us by James. And I would actually like to delve a little bit deeper into the mechanisms that are behind these actions and that can explain uh, why they are so frequent. So I, uh, my part is actually titled Cultural Modes of Thinking. Um, in order to do this, I uh, will use as a case study the recent negotiations over a financial plan for the members of the Eurozone. And I will focus on three specific modes of thinking that you can also see in the slide that are quite prevalent in public debates on the topic. So we have first the dominance of the us versus them narrative. Uh, second, the generalized and stereotypical depiction of the other. And thirdly, the confirmation bias. Um, I think these three modes of thinking appeal to what Rutger Bregman, the Dutch uh, um, well, essayist, I'd say, so accurately labeled the lowest supremacist and tribal instincts in an interview that he gave with the Spanish newspaper La Guardia in 2017. Um, it allows us to justify ideas about ourselves that make us feel good, make us feel proud. We are doing better, we are being richer, we are being smarter, we have been happier, more efficient, etc., than others. This view is problematic because it does not take into account the complex nature of this crisis um, and the general situation of political institutions that are quite complex by default. And more importantly, because instead of building bridges, bridges um, it creates a distance between people. So before going into these modes of thinking, I would like to say a word about the case that I picked. I will not go into the political or economic aspects of it, nor will I assess the final agreement, um, because I'm definitely not an expert in that. Um, my intention then is to study cultural narratives and modes of thinking that define and orientate how we see ourselves and other EU member states. So one word that was already used in the inter well, in the part of the introduction by James and also in, these, uh, in, in this situation is the word of the notion of solidarity. And this already is a word that activates very different cultural connotations. So just by using a dictionary uh, definition by Merriam-Webster, this uh, term solidarity is defined as a unity as of a group or class that introduces or is based, uh, that produces or is based on community of interests, objectives and standards. So in the discussion on the EU budget, we see already two different interpretations of solidarity. In southern Europe, for instance, in Italy, solidarity, solidarity meant an immediate availability of funds to which northern EU members, for instance, the Netherlands, were uh, opposed. On the other hand, in the, let's say, Calvinistic North, uh, which had been saving money in the good years after the previous crisis, the earlier unwillingness of, Italians, of Italian politicians, for instance, Salvini, to stick to EU budgetary rules was perceived as a lack of solidarity. So without going into the discussion of who is right or wrong or any of these more judgmental issues, um, I think it's clear here that the concept of solidarity may have a very different connotation in different cultures, which means we should rethink the concept in terms of what it means for us, the EU as a whole. Um, another complication I would like to point out briefly is the confusion or maybe conflation of solidarity and charity. While the former is a unit based on equality, the latter focuses on generosity and helpfulness, especially toward the needy and uh, or suffering, which is again a uh, definition by uh, Merriam-Webster. This, of course, creates dynamics of power over the rich, for instance, the rich versus the poor or the good versus the bad. Solidarity, thus, is a very powerful concept, and we should certainly not get rid of it, but it's inevitably a cultural construct, too, and we should be aware of that. Um, I will now move to the first mode of thinking, uh, being what I call us versus them, uh, a phenomenon that I study normally in relation to populism. However, this rhetoric is certainly not limited to populists. And actually, the current COVID-19 crisis has revealed its omnipresence, not only in politics, um, but in society at large. 
It consists in dealing with the crisis and corresponding fear by creating a positive self-image to the detriment of others. This uh, can be done quite overtly by putting the blame on the others, or scapegoating the other. Think again of Donald Trump, the Chinese virus, or um, more subtly to picture the other as inferior in order to feel better about the self. So here are some examples from the Dutch news. The one on top is a Belgian mayor who is um, actually mayor of a community very close to the Dutch border. And he actually blames the high number of infected in his municipality uh, to the Dutch, who had at the time um, not as well not as many and, and not as strict measures as the Belgians. And also at the on the top, sorry, on the bottom we have the uh, Dutch expert, a crisis expert, Ida Halsvold, who said that the Netherlands were tackling the crisis much better than Italy. So here again we see quite clearly how this um, us versus them thinking is uh, operationalized. This thinking is clearly activated through fear of and insecurity about the future. And I see it as a defense mechanism that helps people to feel like they are in control. To say our situation is not great, um, but at least we're doing better than X or Y. So unfortunately, the truth is that it is still too early to draw long-term conclusions about which policy is most successful and which health system is best. Um, however, activating the tribal instincts of us versus them is a great tool for politicians to distract people from what is actually not going well. So we have a huge lack of protection and testing material. We've had the initial underestimation of the virus. We've had a uh, very well, problematic bu uh, budget cuts in public health care systems, for instance, in the Netherlands, which have made the system much more vulnerable to crisis. Um, this Closely related to these us versus them rhetoric is the idea of generalization and stereotypes, which I hoped I could show. Yes, um, I'm not even sure if we can really see them through independent tendencies. Um, in order to define the other or justify a certain political position concerning the other, stereotypical and generalizing images of the other are created. So it goes without saying that these characterizations are simplistic and often reality shows a very different picture. So let's take the example of Southern Europeans who are recently, well, not, not only recently, but often depicted as uh, lazy. Um, however, if you look at their working hours in comparison to, for instance, Germany or the Netherlands, they are um, not as lazy as, as, um, at all. Uh, same goes for Northern Europeans who are often described as stingy. Um, however, the image, um, well, it, the idea is not very consistent with the, uh, let's say, the contributions that each country makes to the EU. So I just want to say that these generalizations are generally unhelpful for understanding the complex situation in the EU. And finally, I will discuss the notion of confirmation bias, which I think is a process that we should all be very much aware of. And it is defined by you, uh, sorry, Lee McIntyre in his book, Post Truth, in 2018, as a tendency to search for, interpret, favor, and recall information in a way that confirms one's pre existing beliefs or hypotheses. Um, to illustrate this, two weeks ago, essayist Bas Heine commented in the Dutch newspaper NRC the tendency to consider the corona crisis as a breaking point in history. Um, he considers such conclusions as, and I quote here, and this is actually a translation of what he said, a continuation of their old convictions with a different argument. The anti-globalist will still see a more local world. The anti-capitalist sees the end of neoliberalism and the hater of populism sees the end of populism. In other words, we interpret the current corona crisis and its potential consequences following our own pre-existing ideas. We should be aware that these predictions do not reflect something that will necessarily happen, but rather what these people hope will happen, or in case of a black scenario, hope to avoid, obviously. So that would be my last point, basically. I hope I've shown you that my that cultural modes of, think, of, uh, of thinking are important and should be studied more in depth. Um, in the next part, Pablo Valdivia will first do a first attempt at analyzing uh, political and public discourse, more specifically focusing on cultural references and metaphors. 
So Pablo's up to you. Okay, thank you very much uh, for your great uh, insights. Uh, in my case, what I'm going to do is to uh, share my my PowerPoints because uh, Black, uh, uh, Blackboard Collaborate does not allow uh, basically does not allow uh, the the use of uh, of animations in my in the presentation. So I'm going to share with you. Um, my presentation uh, right now. I hope everybody can see this. Yeah, so I hope everybody can now see my presentation. Works perfectly. Perfect, great. Okay, well, so in my in my presentation, I will focus uh, on so, the relationship between culture and how we use certain language that activates uh, certain and particular behavior, attitudes, uh, worldviews, uh, so to speak. In that sense, it's complementary to what uh, James and Judith has explained so far. And uh, what I would like to try to do is to end with a kind of more positive uh, note, despite of the, the uh, tragic nature of, of the events that are unfolding at, at this particular context. So, First, why cultural narratives and why metaphors are so important? I would like to, to remind uh, those of you who already came to my lectures about this, and uh, also for those of you that this approach is new, to explain a little bit why metaphors are so, so important. Well, basically, before James was talking about uh, how uh, crises are branded, and also Judith was speaking about modes of thinking and how certain rhetorics are very pervasive in the way we construct our, our worldviews. Also, it's important to, to look at uh, how we can uh, create uh, bridges instead of uh, sets of more division, right? And uh, from the field of communication, culture, and literature, we have found that uh, metaphors are extremely important to activate social change. In this sense, uh, I, I always refer to the work of Christian Burgers, who has a great article where he explains how metaphors are so pervasive in communication and how they can activate social change. Uh, he actually mentions in this article that the 16th, approximately 16th uh, percent of uh, all communication is uh, metaphoric in its sense. So, why they are so important? Well, because they are not only, as uh, of course Lakoff and Johnson explained, that not only linguistic devices, but actually they are constructions that they are underlying in our mental structures, in what we could call the, the, our mental grammar. So it's important to, to bear in mind that metaphors provide frames of thinking. So basically when we are talking inside a particular metaphor or set of metaphors, we are neglecting or obscuring other metaphors that could uh, implement different uh, opportunities, uh, different changes, and so on and so forth. As uh, rightly James and Judith uh, explained before, a moment of crisis is a moment of uh, rapture, but also is a moment of opportunity where new things uh, can happen as the structures are being shaken. So therefore, focusing on metaphors, and since we know that language is, is never innocent, Focusing on, this, focusing on these metaphors and these frames of thinking and how they're expressed in language, we can uh, access better how, how uh, social change uh, is, is fostered, it can be configured, and also how it can be implemented in the engineering of our societies. So in this particular context of the uh, COVID-19 crisis, I would like to uh, talk briefly about one particular study case, which is the, the, case, uh, the metaphors of war. Why the metaphors of war that we have uh, been hearing all over, all over the last uh, weeks? Well, because uh, they are prominently creating a particular worldview and a particular explanation of uh, what we are facing these days. I brought you some examples uh, so you can have an idea of what I'm, 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 I'm conveying in, in this lecture. So uh, we can see in the media how these references as doctors, as soldiers, or uh, the lack of resources translated into this metaphor uh, of war, uh, where it seems that uh, basically the, the shortage of protective gear is, is uh, like a, a soldier is going to war without 
uh, a sufficient ammunition or, or protection. And also another very common metaphor is uh, how uh, doctors are at the front line. So always understanding or framing the, the pandemic uh, situation as a part of uh, a situation of war uh, where there is a battle going on. Well, I'm not the first one in the sense I'm not original at, at all. Uh, many other scholars have pointed out that it's not convenient for to this situation by using metaphors of war. Uh, one very good example is the, the article that uh, was published by Wise uh, in the Scientific American, where uh, it was explained that military metaphors actually do not help totally to, to give a, a good uh, uh, idea or create a, a, a way that is sufficient in how we can frame uh, this complex uh, reality, as uh, Judith and James explained before. So, metaphor of wars, uh, metaphors of war related to uh, the, the field of medicine are not new at all. I mean, this is something that uh, was already in ancient Greece, it's something that was uh, for centuries in our cultures. But uh, perhaps, since now we are aware that metaphors are so important to the extent that are an essential part of the mental structures that we use in a precognitive mode of uh, thinking, perhaps it would be a moment to reflect on this and to look for other options for alternatives to uh, metaphors of war. So I was uh, delving into this issue and uh, I was uh, trying to understand better how how these uh, precognitive mechanisms operate, why metaphors of war are so uh, easy to understand in this particular context, which sort, which sort of behavior and attitudes uh, these, these metaphors might trigger. And uh, by reading the excellent book uh, written by Asma and Gabriel, that was recently published by Harvard University Press, The Emotional Mind, there they uh, propose seven prototype emotions. And if you look at the, the sort of emotions that uh, immediately a uh, metaphor of war uh, primes uh, are completely related to very reactive uh, um, emotions like rage, fear, la uh, panic, and so on. Of course, if we have to take decisions and we make these decisions out of fear and panic and rage, uh, by using these uh, uh, primary circuits, what we can see perhaps is that our decisions are not the most efficient or the most uh, well thought. However, perhaps if uh, we look at uh, how the amygdala, for instance, is connected to the creation of emotions and so on, and we look at other possible ways of presenting alternatives to, to these metaphors of war, uh, perhaps we should start trying to create new metaphors that somehow could uh, help us to, to uh, well, basically uh, bring to the fore a different way of uh, configuring this, this, this response to this uh, a particular uh, uh, situation. So that therefore, in, in the next minutes, I'm going to focus on what I would call metaphors of care. Metaphors that uh, activate the circuits uh, that are not related to these uh, violent primal reactions, but actually they are priming other sort of attitudes and behaviors. So, what are metaphors of care? Well, metaphors of care are metaphors that actually are based in these uh, five pillars. Metaphors that we are using the uh, mental uh, structures that connect to semantics of advocacy, encouragement, support, positive regards, and self-disclosure. Basically, in other words, metaphors that connect humans with humans, that instead of establishing rhetorics of us versus them, establish rhetorics of cooperation, collaboration, co-creation, co-leadership. This has been already studied. There's a, a great, great article uh, that is a great classic on, on this issue. Uh, but also, I would like to refer to the great book uh, uh, by Billy Lee called Thinking with Metaphors in Medicine. 
So it seems that we take for granted that perhaps uh, the metaphors that we use in daily language, even if we approach these subjects of uh, COVID-19 crisis, are not, are not that uh, uh, pervasive, but actually they are. And it's very important that when we uh, construct the, the cultural narratives or we participate in the cultural narratives that uh, shape uh, this uh, new, new context, we are well aware of uh, the implications of choosing some metaphors and not others, uh, because uh, some metaphors will uh, obscure uh, uh, other metaphors and will prompt certain re uh, reactions. So metaphors of care, therefore, will not prompt violence or uh, uh, this, this kind of uh, martial, martial language and therefore behavior, but uh, will uh, advocate for a uh, more uh, humanized ways of uh, understanding this this situation and therefore that will of course uh, uh, translate into more solidarity and how new bridges of solidarity can be framed and can be built in this sense uh, i would like to uh, finalize my talk uh, by alluding to one article i published recently where I explained how this is a situation of crisis, of course, uh, very tragic, but also it's a situation where there is a change in the paradigm in different levels, the level of uh, the healthcare, but also the level of education. Actually, what we are doing right now here is uh, uh, connecting to different ways, experimental ones, of uh, um, trying to communicate contents and trying to, to uh, make a meaningful and thoughtful uh, process of uh, transfer, not only of uh, information, but also of co-creation of, of knowledge. So in this sense, if we have to think about uh, positive ways of uh, living this crisis or uh, trying to, to improve structures that perhaps uh, before uh, were not at the center of our attention, but uh, uh, there's no doubt that it require now all our undiv undivided attention. For me, these uh, two essential pillars to move forward are based on the right to health, that was subject of, of this article that I co-authored with uh, Gemma Ocaña, and also the right to education. I will focus uh, lastly on the points of uh, the rights of education. So I think we have a great, great opportunity uh, to to change and to improve and to move forward in many respects and also to abandon certain modes of thinking that um, uh, it seems to not work uh, anymore or at least that they were working by implying a lot of limitations. So we, we need to rethink even how we understand education. So I suggest, and this would be open for, for the discussion, that uh, we take also this opportunity of the COVID-19 crisis as a moment for promoting a change, a radical change from uh, instructor-paced education to more self-paced education, thanks to the use of new technologies, that we try to abandon all ways of understanding education from the accumulative knowledge transfer to the co-creative uh, knowledge production. And also that we try to leave authority framings that we have seen that they are divisive, uh, divisive. Sorry, that they foster this this rhetoric of us versus them, and to move into uh, frames that are uh, based on co-leadership uh, affordances. In this sense, I would like to conclude with a very specific example of uh, what I mean about self-paced education, co-creative knowledge production, and co-leadership co affordances. Uh, that has been inspired by the great uh, scholar Eric Masur, who is one of uh, our inspirations in peer instruction and active learning. And in this regard, how actually technology should not uh, be uh, seen as a kind of imposition over us, but actually technology can help us to uh, build more democratic societies, to democratize knowledge, and to build more equal societies. In that sense, uh, several reports in the last weeks have pointed out how actually there is what we could call cognitive inequality, 
and this uh, cognitive inequality is not only based in the access to technology but also in the use of, of these uh, technologies. In that sense, uh, I would like to leave with uh, this, this uh, example, which is this uh, social uh, uh, reader platform, Peruso, that is truly collaborative, where a different sort of training, different sort of education uh, is uh, fostered and promoted, where the, the instructor is not longer at the center of the instruction, but actually is part of the, the co-creation process. So in that sense, and also as a kind of overall conclusion to, to, the, to the talk and by linking all the points made by Judith and James, it seems that the COVID-19 crisis is uh, actually putting our societies in a moment of uh, crossroads where we see a previous society which was uh, pretty much based on cultural narratives of uh, a division, of uh, hierarchies and so on. And perhaps we have here a kind of uh, unique uh, opportunity in history to move to societies which are more inclusive, which are uh, more uh, uh, transparent in its uh, uh, participation uh, channels, and also that uh, foster metaphors of care instead of uh, metaphors of war, division, and hatred. Thank you very much for your time. Well, thank you so much, dear Pablo, and thank you, dear James and dear Judith, for this fantastic presentation, which covered so many different fields. I'm sure there will be a lot of, of questions. Uh, I have just now activated um, the, the chat option uh, so that uh, everyone in the audience basically can ask a question. All you have to do is in the lower right corner uh, of your screen, click on these nice two arrows on pink ground, and then after that, click on the speech bubble. Uh, and I'm already receiving numerous thank yous through the chat message. Thank you guys for joining us. But still, you could also now write a question there. Um, thanks for the positive feedback. Now, uh, if there are any questions, please don't hesitate to write your questions in these chat boxes. And uh, oh, there's practical questions whether the slides will be available. Uh, I'm sure we can figure this out amongst the speakers, but you will be also able to see the slides within the video recording of these lectures, which will be can be found on the web page of uh, this lecture series as of tomorrow in all likelihood or otherwise uh, very soon. Um, so everything you have seen and heard here today, uh, you will be able to rewatch and rehear. Now, I'm checking uh, chats right now to see whether there are any uh, questions from the audience at this stage. So again, equivalent with uh, with a live action and real academic life would be uh, the room is full, but no one dares to ask a question. So I can, ah, here we have a question for you, Did Thank you very much. Uh, I read out the question. I have a question for you, Did She mentioned the difference between solidarity and charity. How can it be possible to distinguish between these two and how can this influence the popula population in such times of crisis? Dear Judith, would you like to respond to that? Yes, yeah, sure. Um, I think it is, first of all, I think the first thing that's important is that we should be aware of this difference because I think too often, as I said, also these two notions are confused. So I think the starting point is already to recognize whether you're actually being solidary or just, uh, or, or rather referring to notions of charity. So um, I think what the main difference is, as I also said in the in the talk, um, in if we're being um, if we're dealing with solidarity, then there is equality. So it's kind of a team um, thing, right? So the European Union is a team. Um, I think that works also well with the with the um, uh, the metaphors of, uh, of care. So we are doing something together. We are being co-leaders, right? And um, charity is is more unequal, unequal um, to that um, if you, if you think about it, because it's more to do with like some 
someone is in trouble and then others are kind of in a way being so good hearted uh, that they want to help right so it's more of, sort of a christian maybe calvinist um notion of oh we are so good uh, let's say that we actually help others right so i think there is there's some power um dynamics uh, involved there which i think is uh, is problematic um and how can that influence the population so i think these net this, this idea of charity actually fosters these notions of us versus them because it, it promotes the idea that we are better than them in a way is that an answer <laughs> to the question i think so no objections so far thank you very Great. much <laughs> any any further questions from the audience please don't hesitate oh yes there's another question uh, i read it out thank you for these very inspiring talks sorry i've just lost my way there uh, okay uh, well, there are a few other questions, in fact, so I will do my best to to uh, approach them one by one. Um, I thought, so I read out now, I thought Pablo's comment on metaphors of war and COVID-19 was very apt. In the USA, many health workers even have signs in their front yard saying, a hero lives here. The examples you used, Pablo, were from US publications. I'm wondering if there have been similar metaphors in the European press that you are aware of. Pablo, do you want to respond to that? Yes, it's, it's my pleasure to respond to that. Um, basically, this is actually a great, great question. Uh, we have uh, uh, now evidence that this is uh, uh, like, the, like the virus is a global metaphor that has been used everywhere uh, all over the world, uh, not only in the US, but also in Europe, Asia, absolutely everywhere uh, to, to describe uh, and to frame uh, the, the, the way in which we understand uh, this situation, right? So it has not been only in US, but also in Europe, in Asia, absolutely everywhere. And this is actually a fascinating uh, issue for me in order to as, as a kind of a conceptual metaphor scholar is really is really a fascinating issue because that means that actually there must be certain mental structures as asthma and gabriel were suggesting in in, in uh, their recent publication there might be some kind of uh, circuits or universals operating uh, across all uh, uh, human communities uh, of course this this um uh, ways of uh, framing the very specific metaphor within the conceptual metaphor of, of uh, a disease as a war, uh, uh, let's say, a, a picture that, uh, of course, uh, this, this might be there. There might be certain differences, is what I wanted to say, uh, across different cultures, but clearly the mental structure remains the same of uh, uh, in this metaphor of war as a way of uh, showcasing the this this current crisis perhaps it's because it's so well connected with these uh, three primal reactions of uh, fear uh, rage and and, and panic uh, that i was explaining before but absolutely i think uh, my my goal in one of the next uh, articles is that uh, i will try to look to some kind of uh, global metaphors, but also global alternatives to these metaphors in, in this uh, particular crisis. So thank you very much for the question. I hope I answered it. I, I really loved the question. It was really great. <laughs> and in connection with that, maybe just as an add-up question, I uh, read a comment here on a particular metaphor used by the Dutch Prime Minister Mark Rutte, who referred to the Dutch society as, I quote, a patient in one of his first talks to the public. So that might be an interesting follow-up question. Uh, the question here reads, I think he was saying something like the Netherlands have now become a patient. He was generally praised for this, for using this metaphor. So Pablo, do you agree or should we have referred to Europe as a whole or even the world? That was the question posed here in the chat. And I might add, or could we also consider this metaphor and all its Passive, passivity and and so on, possibly as a problem in itself. What do you think about the patient metaphor? 
Well, this is also a really, really great point. Uh, what we have seen is that these uh, uh, mainstream metaphors, if I can, I can call them uh, as this to, to make some sense of it, uh, these metaphors uh, have been very effective at uh, re-nationalizing uh, and re-semantizing uh, national cultures and national identities, right? So I think that uh, it's not a coincidence that uh, metaphors of war have been uh, obscuring other metaphors of such as uh, being patient or uh, other metaphors of care and, and so on and so forth. Ideally, we should be able to create metaphors that help us to cope with the global pandemia. So basically, this is not a, the virus does not understand of uh, borders or uh, cultural identities or national identities and so on and so forth is affecting uh, everywhere and everybody uh, and therefore in that sense uh, I, I think that uh, we should have been using metaphors that somehow frame better this global reality. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Uh, there's another question yet on metaphors which is for any of the speakers in regards to the use of humor in terms of care during the corona crisis. Now, before any of the speakers answer this, I might take this occasion to um, ask you all, invite you all to next week's lecture, next week, Friday at 11 o'clock, we'll have a lecture by our great 11 o'clock CET, I should add. Uh, we have a great uh, a lecture by a great colleague, Alberto Godioli, who will very much focus on <coughs> uses and roles of humor in the context of uh, corona crisis discourses but maybe there are also some responses to uh, to this question right now from any of the speakers so this is about the use of humor in terms of care during the corona crisis any thoughts guys well uh, i mean so as you said so in our chair the expert is alberto godioli so so i am not an expert on this particular issue uh, but uh, what, uh, for instance, uh, ecologists have been mm, really eager to explain over the last month is how humor should play a significant role in the way that we construct our frames, our worldviews regarding the, the COVID-19 crisis, uh, the, the importance of uh, not so taking a kind of frivolous uh, uh, outlook at what ha is happening, but actually to understand uh, the situation from a, a way that is uh, not so establish, establishing a kind of uh, vicious circle around the drama narrative. And humor is very, very disruptive. So if we want to uh, get out of this kind of over dramatization of the crisis and uh, uh, how this could be misused against us by appealing to our fears, our irrational uh, uh, panic, uh, uh, and, and so on. Then uh, humor, I think, could be a very vi valuable tool for avoiding uh, to fall in this uh, over-dramatization that could potentially lead to the manipulation of citizens and so on and so forth. And maybe to add to that, because I think there's also um, a possible negative uh, influence, because I think humor is also um, possibly used for division. So because you can laugh about someone else or uh, something else. Right. So it can also be uh, a tool for division, I just want to say. And I hope that is not um, uh, the, um, let's say, um, the conclusion of the talk that Alberto is going to give last week, uh, next week, sorry. Mm -hmm. Great, okay, well, I have a couple of more questions, but unfortunately we're running out of time. Actually, we are all already over, another nice equivalent to, to real life academia, so to speak. Um, maybe, maybe just one or two more questions. Of course, one of the uh, few advantages of this communicative situation is, of course, that everyone can always uh, sneak out of this virtual classroom if uh, your time uh, plans do not allow to stay with us. Uh, so we'll just uh, take 
the opportunity to go on with some of these more really, really interesting questions. So here's a question uh, uh, for you once more. I've noticed, I quote the question, I'll read it out. I've noticed that us versus them, this line of thinking prevents people from looking for the root causes of global health crisis, which has always existed, but only now is on the forefront when we are affected heavily and not just them. For this pandemic specifically, I've seen a lot of people blame specific practices in China in such a way that it doesn't apply to themselves. So that would be another widening of the perspective with a particular reference to China. Any response, Judith? Yes, I think I'm just think there is a follow up a bit lower. So I'm thinking, oh, yeah. for example, how people talk about eating specific animals in certain areas, but not, for example, looking at how animal agriculture in general res results in more pandemic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. I think this is a very good comment. Um, very interesting indeed. Um, I, um, I think I, I need to think about this a bit more in depth in a, to, to formulate a good answer, but I just think this is a great point for, for future research. So I, uh, I hope uh, we, can, we can focus on this and, uh, and yeah, definitely I totally agree with, with the point. Worth mapping all the new and uh, new cliches uh, or new, new prejudices and uh, re-evolving old prejudices throughout the world. It would be a sad job, but certainly also a necessary one, I guess. Yeah. And I think um, it's also interesting here, the historic component. So we, we feel like we are not used to such pandemics anymore, but we don't have to look so much back in history in order to find some examples of Spanish flu and the cholera epidemics in, in Europe. And actually, mm -hmm. um, historic practices of uh, of quarantine, etc. So it's is not um, it's, there is a lot of material to look into. I think. Mm -hmm. Great. And another question, also in the direction of Judith. Follow up question to the very first que question that was posed to you, Judith. Uh, so first of all, I quote: Thank you for the lecture. Follow up question to the first one. Judith, would you agree that solidarity can be potentially dangerous since it is based on group or class identity and not necessarily on legitimate reasoning? So that would be a rather shift in perspective suggested here. We probably, I continue to quote, we probably find the highest amount of solidarity in religious sects and many other cases of ideological quotation false consciousness, to use the famous wording by Theodor Adorno. <laughs> any, any thoughts on this spontaneously to, to kind of yeah, twist or, or turn the perspective here in regards to solidarity, which is usually, of course, a very uh, positively connotated term? Yes, it's very interesting, actually, because I have had this, this same discussion already with Pablo. So maybe Pablo can also join the conversation at some point. Um, we were just discussing, well, the, the the problem, well, if there would be a problem, let's say, of, uh, of the notion of solidarity, I think here maybe two points that are important. First one being that I think if solidarity is dangerous, maybe we should think whether it is real solidarity and maybe not solidarity in disguise, um, maybe as charity. And uh, second, I think, is the point that he that Christian mentions of religious sects and um, what they have in common, I think, and that's also one important point that needs more, um, more focus maybe in research, like what do we have in common? So if we are talking about the EU or the Eurozone, um, then what is the thing we have in common and why should we be solidary? Which is on the other hand also, and that would bring me, if I may take the, <laughs> the um, the opportunity there to establish a link to James first part of of, of your of your lecture um, because the solidarity is also I or it seems to be one of the one of the big aspects of this commercialization of of the crisis right so uh, when you have these pictures of of I don't know enterprises helping out or when you have these activities of of um, masks serving as basically as as kind of advertising um, uh, spaces uh, that is of course directly aiming at I would think aiming at at, at such such notions of of solidarity so positive notions of solidarity uh, James would you agree that this is a particular 
particular line of 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 this evolving uh, commercialization of the crisis yeah absolutely so i i think what we kind of wanted to show in this first part and obviously you can argue whether that it, when it comes to that those kind of advertising things or imagery whether that's really an kind of unsolidary type of action but i think at the very least it's an it's an interesting practice because of the fact that it's uh, it is an act which purports to be done in solidarity which is actually a rather i would say selfish or individualistic or self inward looking kind of act in order to place one's own brand at the forefront of um of of the mind of the consumer um that there is a, a it, so th th this is very interesting i think in terms of what you was just saying about things that appear to be done in solidarity but whether they are actually uh, not uh, really uh, solidary acts when we when we t take a look below the surface and there we could we could again use the term false, con false consciousness clearly yeah. it was raised beforehand right so now so. guys in the meantime since we're since we're now also approaching the end of our extra quarter of an hour i finally found the question that popped up earlier as a pop-up but then i couldn't find it in the in the chat thread anymore because it was sent to me directly so i'll read this out i think it's it's a great like kind of closing line here uh, so i read thanks for these very inspiring talks which illustrate not only the need for a humanities approach to current affairs and problems but also the enormous benefit of approaching any challenge in a multidisciplinary and concerted manner might it be productive to explore how we could include voices from economics in this discussion given the financial dimensions of a crisis which we need to consider. Well, thank you very much, first of all, for the flowers. And in regards to the question, it could be indeed very productive, I think. And we're already thinking about now about continuing this, uh, this lecture series after the summer, then maybe also uh, including external guests, for instance, from academics. I think that's really a, a brilliant idea. Uh, to, to broaden the horizon further, because what I referred to in the very beginning are our bubbles, our academic bubbles, of course, also uh, are uh, can be, or that that notion, that concept can also be referred to academic disciplines, of course. Okay, uh, I think we should leave it at that. Thank you all. One small thanks to the brilliant speakers today. Thank you to Konstantin Mirau for taking care of participation. And thanks above all for all of you who have stuck with us. Participation was great, We're very happy. Uh, that you uh, that liked it and uh, of course I can say I'll, I'll just mention it once more next week uh, you are all very warmly uh, invited to uh, join the next um, uh, uh, lecture in this series uh, by uh, Alberto Gordioli uh, then at 11 o'clock um, Central European time on Friday next week all information abstract speaker info and of course access to the lecture can be accessed through our website so thanks to everyone out there stay safe and uh, take care and hopefully see and hear and read you soon goodbye